different parts of the country or internationally been in our seminars. Right. But we're going to start by having a weekly session called Married to the Business. Now, as yes. you know, we are the co-founders of Couples Academy, but we also have a program called the Couples Business School. Yes, the Couples Business School is a program that is really the joining of two hearts. We have been working together in business for years. I've been behind the scenes building websites, branding, creating book covers and publishing books, doing everything behind the scenes, and we've worked together. And because I work in my business right now, I have an agency, and I work with six and seven-figure coaches. I help them launch their products. I'm out there in the field all the, t all the time in business, and I see the struggles that couples that are married go through. It's a different dynamic. There are different pain points. And the Couples Business School is really addressing all of those really specific details that couples that are married in business go through. So we are thrilled to be launching that this year. And so every single Wednesday, midday, or at least for now, midday, until we figure out a time that really works best for everyone, we're going to be talking about what it takes to be successful in your marriage and in your business. So we'll break up the segment. We'll talk about relationships for the first half and business for the second half, because there are some of you um, who have, you know, all types of challenges in your relationship, knowing how to make this thing work. We get asked the question all the time, how in the world do you spend your entire day yeah. with your wife yeah. as crazy as she is? How do you make this thing work? Nobody has ever said that, but people do say, how do you spend your whole day with that crazy person that is like <laughs> cracking the whip to get this done, get that done? It is actually a craft that yeah. we had to hone. We had to learn how to work with each other. So we're excited to start talking about those things because we've discovered, and Hassan, you've discovered in your practice, working with couples mm -hmm. who are going through other issues that when they have a business, it heightens the issue. It makes it even more difficult to sort out because now it's not just you're that you're dealing with relationship issues, but you're also dealing with work stuff. Exactly, exactly. Right. And I think one of the biggest challenges that people face, period, OK, whatever the relational state of affairs they may be in, whether they're dating in a committed courtship, engaged or married, is communication. Mm -hmm. Communication is the number one problem that people come to us with. And I like to say, you know what, you really don't have a sex problem. You really don't have a money problem. You really don't have a parenting or an in-law problem. What you have is an inability to effectively yeah. communicate. Yeah. And not only does that impact your relationship, that impacts your business as well. Absolutely. That was one of our major issues that we are still yeah. sorting out because he doesn't listen to me all the time. Oh, he needs to listen. See, now you're going to put me on blast in front of all these people <laughs> yes. and give them a false impression. No. But we did struggle with that. And, you know, it's interesting because in the book we wrote The Audacity of Marriage, 10 Principles of Lifelong Partnership. There's a chapter entitled help my mouth is killing my marriage yeah. because it literally almost did in our relationship yeah. and so what we've done is we had to take some time and sort through those issues to have a better form of communication and what we realize is that at the end of the day just because you can articulate your point just because you believe you're well versed in your opinion on a subject does that mean that you are a good communicator because your words may come out so the message may be clear but your messaging may be getting in the way and what we've realized is that there are literally three components to a successful communication or effective communication it is important that you understand what those are so number one and if you've been a part of our facebook experience you've heard me talk about this before but it bears repeating itself the first component component of effective communication are your words now, your words are what you say. That is 7% of your communication. But number two is your tonality, how you say what you say. That is 23% of your communication. And number three, your facial expressions, your body language, your gestures, that is 70% of your communication. And many people get it so wrong. And so the reality is, just because you say something and the message is clear, Oftentimes, it's interrupted or confused or misinterpreted by your tone and by your body language. It's just like if I were to look at Danielle and be like, I love you. Now, was that convincing? No, it wasn't convincing at all. My words said, I love you, but I was rolling my eyes. I was breathing hard. I was sucking my teeth. My body language wasn't even conducive for the message. So my tone and my body language got in the way. And oftentimes we have to realize how the words, our tonality and our body language, they're all communicating different messages. And if those messages aren't in sync, then your message will not be properly received. Yeah, right. Now, what was my body language indicating to the world? <laughs> Can I get a word in? No, not yet. Um, so here's the thing, guys. Like, seriously, what he's saying is so spot on. 
And I think for women, because women, we like to perceive things all the time, right? We're always reading in between the lines, <laughs> right? So like when uh, your spouse comes to you and is saying something to you and their face is wrong, that's it. The message is shut down, cut off. We cannot hear anything. Even if you said, love you, baby, we don't know what you said because you've already approached us with the look. The look that we have learned over years, the look that we know means a certain thing. We mean, we know the look when you're sincere. We know the look when you're lying. We know the look when you're you're um, <laughs> telling some of the truth, but not when you're omitting facts. We know the look. So when you come to us, the first thing we're doing is we're perceiving. We're like, let's see where that at, where he's at. And if you come to us and make sure that you have your positioning right, and you really do come because it comes from the heart. Right. That's the truth. Like it really comes from the heart. So when you come to me, if you have an attitude about something, then naturally, because in the heart, your attitude, you're going to show it in your face. Right. But when you come to me and you really are, you know, heartfelt and humble, then you have a whole different kind of position. So you could even be mad about something. But if you come in with the right heart, I'm going to be like, oh, OK, I understand. So it's so important. The body language thing is humongous. It's huge. And guess what? If you have the wrong tone, your partner is just going to wind up tuning you out anyway. Yeah. And so I've always realized that when we were getting into conversations that didn't go well, she would be quick to shut it down before it got worse. And, I, you know, I felt interrupted and cut off. But yeah. at the end of the day, if I had kept on going, then my temper would have increased. My volume would have increased her. You know, she was very sensitive. So she would have definitely caught feelings and it would have made way and worse. That's, and that's my style of communication because yeah. I'm, I'm the type and you'll probably talk about this and probably have that. I will. I don't want to. I don't want to fight. I don't want to argue. I would rather sweep it under the rug. I don't want to mm. deal with it. I, I want to. You know, and if I deal with it, I certainly don't want to deal with it on somebody else's timing. So, it, you know, after years, I'm sure, and years and years and years, you have learned my timing. So we don't have those situations where you're trying to bow be, uh, brow beat, yeah. brow beat me into talking about it now. Right. See, what she's talking about are the two personalities that many people have in their relationship when it comes to communication and conflict resolution, the peacekeeper and the peacemaker. Right. Now, Danielle is the peacekeeper, and the peacekeeper just peace. wants to keep the peace. They don't want to fight. Love. They don't want to argue. They don't want to get into it. And so in a peacekeeper's extreme, they can become emotionally detached from the situation. They rather sweep the issues under the carpet, never to deal with it. But that carpet gets bigger and bigger and bigger and consumes the room because you have all these unresolved issues because they just want peace. Yeah. But then you have the peacemaker and the peacemaker wants peace as well. But the peacemaker will do anything and everything to get the peace that he or she wants. The peacemaker will go to war to get the peace that they right. want. So a peacemaker like myself, or as I have been, wants to address it now. I don't care where we are. I don't care who's around us. I don't care that we're in public. So I don't care that we're in the supermarket, aisle three. Yeah. We need to deal with this issue right now. And so people are looking at us like we're crazy. Like, why is this couple fight? But you know what? If we don't resolve it now, we feel like, you know what? It'll never get resolved. And so when the peacekeeper and the peacemaker operate in their extremes, you both lose. So to Daniel's point, you've got to learn timing. You've got to learn how to meet somewhere in the middle. So there's got to be ground rules yes, to rules. access effective communication. Yes, absolutely. And I think that that, I mean, whenever we're ready to segue into the business part of it, I just want to say this little piece that think about being in those scenarios and relating it to business too. Mm -hmm. You know, time and place is so important when you're running a business as a couple. So yes, rules are rules of engagement are so important. So rules of engagement include making sure that you talk at the appropriate time because not every time is a good time. Like yes. if it's 1130 at night and I got to get up at five o'clock in the morning, prepare for work, I'm not ready to have right. Nobody wants, listen, I can't sleep. You know <laughs> what I mean? No, like, and, and then that person is the, the other person who is the one that wants to kind of deal with it later, probably needs some time to simmer down, wants to, is thinking about the next day, doesn't want to get into it right now. So right. what you're going to do is break right into another argument yep. right there. Yep. 
So you have to have the right timing where you're talking at the right time where the energy is where it needs to be. Because if she's drained and exhausted and halfway into her third sleep and I'm bright eyed and bushy tailed and I'm ready for a conversation, it's not going to work out. Work. And then at the same time, you got to be careful how much time you dedicate to that issue. Because some people could talk for five and six and seven hours into the sunset. Yeah. And the other person is looking at their clock like, come on now, come on, come on, okay. come on. So there's got to be a minimum and maximum amount of time. Time that you dedicate to an issue and if we don't get it all done today there's always, there's tomorrow. always tomorrow there's another day yeah there's another day and you know what and I'm guilty of this because I will run something into the ground because I really feel like you need to get my point and I feel like okay he didn't understand me because if he understood me then he wouldn't have made this remark so let me repeat all of it again and spend another 20 minutes saying what I don't think he got because if he had got it then he wouldn't have said that well, that is another thing that plays into the rules of engagement, because if we have rules of engagement that's that and we create trigger words right. and we say, OK, this means that I understood and we put practices in place like mirroring, which you probably yeah. have expressed. But literally in a conversation, it might it slows it down significantly. But literally when you're in a conversation or argument or a heated, passionate conversation, you will mirror what the person said so that there's no arguing. You're literally saying, okay, I understood what you said. You're saying X, Y, and Z, right? And the other person can confirm or deny that you understood. So before you're moving on to your argument, you are forced to acknowledge what the other person said. So putting rules like that into place where no one has to repeat things over and over again and exhaust the conversation right. so that even when you've come to a solution, you're frustrated and you're annoyed just because of the conversation. You put rules in place. <laughs> and so, listen, we're going to be talking about communication probably in multiple segments because it's one of those issues that always come up in the lives of couples and their relationships. But there's the communication within your relationship, and then there's the communication, the way you function and operate in your business. And so, so many of you are copreneurs. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Danielle's going to talk about what that means, but you're struggling to figure out how to make this thing work, and that's why we're doing Married to the Business. Yay! So anyway, for years, um, I've been talking, Hassan and I have been talking about doing the Couples Business School. Because we're in business, because we've been in business for 15 years, literally, we started and we started working together from day one. We've never not been in business together. In addition to that, we began to raise a family in the midst of that. So we had one baby, two, three, four babies. It's crazy. Yeah. But we've raised a business and we've raised our children all at the same time. And we've grown up all at the same yes. time. And there is something to be said for that because a business is another child. It's an actual breathing, living organism that you've got to feed and you've got to nurture and you've got to grow alongside with children. And so with that has been a lot of stress. We've learned a lot. We've had a lot of ups. We've had a lot of downs. And as a result of that, we have gained some serious knowledge. And when we encounter couples that we see out there that are just like us, they're in business together and we see the frustrations when someone has a business and that business just hasn't kicked off and it's causing a rift inside the marriage. Then um, one spouse is frustrated, they're, they have a job, they're holding it down, they're responsible for the bills. And then the spouse has a dream of a business that just isn't kicking off and they're not sure what to do and they don't know what's going on wrong. The house is dis or in disarray. The kids are running around like lunatics. The laundry's not done. The house is a wreck. Yep, we've done all that. We've experienced all that. Real talk, we're still trying to work on all of that. Understand. So what we realize is that couples that are in business have to understand who do they compare themselves to? Okay, let me just put it in layman terms. I, a mother of four, am not gonna compare myself to, um, uh, I'm sorry, I am mother of four and an entrepreneur. I'm not gonna compare myself to a mother of one or two who's got a nine to five and their child may be in daycare all day. I can't compare myself to that. Right. I can't make a judgment on that. I can't look at that and be like, oh, that's the ideal. I'm not meeting the standard. You know, when I take my kids out Saturday morning and they're wearing mismatch socks, one is purple, one is green, you know, polka dot pants and a red and polka dot shirt and they're playing in the yard. But I see the neighbor across the street and she's playing and she's in a dress with a pigtail and all that. And it's just one over there. I can't compare myself to that. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So what what I've discovered going out, working with business owners meeting other business owners that are co-preneurs, that are raising a family, that are dealing with some of the same struggles as that, that I am, is that, oh, I need to find my tribe, period. I need to find my tribe. All those people, they're doing wonderful things in the world. They found their place. 
I've got to find my tribe. My tribe is an entrepreneur. My tribe is a copreneur working with their spouse. Now, what's a copreneur? A copreneur is someone who is in a relationship with a business partner who is either the sole breadwinner and one of them is the sole breadwinner and the other one is struggling or maybe has a lucrative business or you are actually together working side by side in a business like Hassani and I do or you are two corporators with two businesses like Hassani and I are. So even if you're not the person in yeah. business working the business if you are married to an entrepreneur you're a copreneur because your responsibility is to hold down the house keep things stable run the business of your house and guess what there's a stress in that a major major stress in that because your spouse is off working all day long you might feel alone disconnected detached the kids might be like where's daddy We've been through all of it. We literally were just talking about, okay, things are shifting. Our kids are getting older. We need to make some adjustments here. We've, we've mastered that, but they've grown. We've grown. There's some other things coming. Right now, Hassani are, and I are dealing with traveling. We're doing a lot more traveling together. That, this is new because we didn't have the book. And so, yes, I would travel with Hassani here and there, but now every time we're getting booked, they're wanting both of us. So we're like, okay, this is a new dynamic in our family. This is not something that an, a regular nine to five-ish you know, family deals with. And so when I go out and I'm at business conferences and I speak to others, I, I, I it, it really, it really burns me when I hear, you know, an expert or, you know, some business coach that has called a, 250 people to a room and they're going to help them make their first six figures or reach multiple six figures. And when it comes to the pitch, they completely disregard the spouses. Yes. I see that all the time. That comp that yeah. crosses everything that we stand for. You cannot tell me that it doesn't matter what your spouse thinks. This is about you. This moment is about you, and you're asking me to make a thirty thousand dollar commitment. Right. And and uh, the problem with that is that that's very single minded. Yeah. And when you're married and 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 have a business together, you can't make major decisions by yourself mm -hmm. without consulting, without talking about, without negotiating through certain issues with your spouse. Because yeah. I'm gonna tell you. Independent decision making, and that's one of the biggest challenges that people deal with. Independent decision making is like a cancer to your marriage. You are one. That's why we talk about the power of the marriage mastermind, which we'll get into, and how you need the input, the insight, the perspective of your partner on any decision, particularly when dealing with business. Absolutely. And I feel like when I when I see this, I'm so mad. I'm just like, how could this just they totally disregard me because I actually cannot make that decision. I know that there are a bunch of people in literally I, one of the conferences that I went to and I go to conferences most all year. I'm traveling to conferences, conferences. So anybody who has met me at a conference or seen me at a conference, I'm not pointing out any particular conference. OK, <laughs> but I am going to say that one time a woman came up to me and she was pressured to make the decision. She was married and she was pressured to make the decision to to uh, put a pretty hefty investment into a business coach and she says I'm not even gonna tell my husband about this like he don't have to know about this I've got my money stash and he, this is none of his business and my thing is this you know like if you've got your own money stash fantastic whatever that's between you and your spouse but if it's your own money stash don't you still feel some obligation or commitment level to let your spouse know what you're doing like why I don't I really don't like the idea of fostering the secrecy. Right. So anyway, right. that's a, that's me getting on my, my soapbox about some of the things that we are going to do differently. Yeah. Uh, one of the other things that really burns me is just the fact that they're gouging couples. Like, listen, if I go into your business program, guess what? My husband is going to be in your business program. I'm going to share everything I learned with him. Uh, it, we are one. Married folks are one. And there are quite a few. Um, business coaches that I know and I love that actually get that concept and they will totally discount, you know, for the second spouse and everything like that. But I really just believe that it's about if you're really about helping people get to the next level, yeah. level, if you're really about helping couples reach their six figures and beyond, because believe it or not, a lot of people who are in business and have been in business for years have never reached six figures and that's are true. still running a, and, and living life on this business. And this is why you have one spouse that's still out of the house having to work because they haven't even reached the figures yet. So did I just go on my soapbox? I'm it's jumping okay. off my soapbox. We're gonna do things different. And um, Couples Business School, there's so much, we we have already opened the Couples Business School and it's, it's kind of a fragment of what the program is gonna be because we're gonna do such 
big things. And anybody who's in the program now is going to obviously be grandfathered or grandmothered into what we're doing next, but we're taking it to another level. But I want to talk a little bit about communication with um, co-preneurs because to me, um, I think that a lot of what Hassani and I went through, maybe we wouldn't have gone through so much if we had understood how to maneuver our business, the business side of our relationship, because Asani and I have honestly always been good friends. Mm -hmm. Like even when we were going through our worst, we got along, we loved each other. There were times we didn't like each other, yeah. but we naturally worked. Like we just naturally worked. And because we were mixing our relationship with our business relationship, it just got so messed up. I mean, you know, we didn't know how to take the hats off the relationship was dying to keep the the business thriving yeah. because you know early on in our business you know we had little children too like you know we were trying to juggle it all it was just a, we didn't even have a team at the time so it was just like okay we're we're married for an hour so that we can have a married business you know what i'm talking about right married business all right let's get that done next kid business next hat work all night long coffee break work 24 hours seven days a week no break and no real division between our personal life and our love connection right. and then our business building. Right. and then all of a sudden the passion that we once had for each other shifted now it became about the passion for the business and the passion we had died you know, and I think that it's important to find balance in your relationship so that even if you have to put it on a calendar and schedule it, even if you have to time block. I hated that. You got to stop. Because when Hassani first introduced that concept to me of putting intimacy on a calendar, I was I was just so not down like that is I mean, I can't see the questions, but I wish you would just raise your hand in some kind of way in the Facebook Live if you agree, women, because in our minds we're like, oh, that's just so not romantic. But let me tell you something. Because of the fact that at that time, literally as a woman, I was avoiding my husband. I was tired, you know? It's just like I knew that I was not make, making my marital obligation, for lack of a better word. You know, I knew that he had desires that I just was too tired to fulfill. I wasn't interested. You know women, you get what I'm saying. And so what was happening is I would be in avoidance. And I would say, OK, you know, it's been such an amount of time and I could see he's getting frustrated and annoyed. And I was having a certain level of anxiety about it, of the expectation. When I just went ahead and submitted to that calendar, which we all should be submitting to a calendar in life anyway. So it just makes sense. Exactly. It's not even foreign. Like if you're not living by a calendar, then that's number one for you. But when I d decided to submit to that, there was such a pressure release. Like, I, I was like, okay, it's Tuesday, you know? And then Wednesday, we're going to do like a date night and it's going to just be romantic, non sexual intimacy. Yay, I'll be fulfilled there. And then on another day, so we, it was like, I no longer had to think about it or wonder, is he going to tap my shoulder tonight? I'm tired. You know, I no longer. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with the tap. Uh, yeah, there's something a wrong. A tap every now and then. Husbands, okay. don't, do not tap your wives. See, no, don't no. do this. Tap your wife. Don't do this at either. Three in the middle in the <laughs> Like that's that's between you and your bed sheets. But anyway, at the end of the day, I, I felt a sense of relief because I knew what to expect. And it might just been a personality thing. Like I just I like to know what to expect. I don't mm -hmm. like any surprises, right? Well, I mean, I love being surprised for my birthday, but you know, I'm not the type of person where I want you showing up at my front door. Hey, surprise no. I need twenty four hours notice. <laughs> you understand? So that's that's my personality yeah. type, but it brought such a sense of relief. Go and, ahead, and, and the and the timing or the time, uh, what do I call it? time blocking? It has more, uh, more than just about sex. Like it's about date time. Yes, it's about family time. If you think about it, if you look at your schedule, the majority of your time is spent at work. So you're spending like eight to ten hours a day developing relationships with other people, whether it be your coworkers or your customers or your managers. And so other people know more about you than your own spouse. I mean, yeah. statistically in the US and in the UK, the average couple spends approximately five minutes a day communicating. Yeah. Now, could you imagine five minutes a day? How's work? Work is work. So you're just talking about the basics of things yeah. or you're talking about bills. You're talking yeah. about the kids. You're talking about homework. You're talking about you're talking about Clients. everything that has nothing to do with, with your you. relationship. Yes, yes. So when you're spending couple time together, not just sex, but just couple time, you know, like, for instance, on our calendar, uh, there's certain days where we go out and date. 
But then there are days when we may do a movie, a TV marathon, like we'll catch up on our show because we don't really watch TV throughout the course of the week. So we'll dedicate a day to go two, three hours straight yeah. and just one show after the other. We have time for the kids. We have time. So you've got to do that in order to have balance. And I think at the end of the day, before we wrap up, a lot of people talk about well, how do you have balance? You know, when you have a ministry or a business and a family and you have your own passions. Well, I don't you know, if you look at a 24 hour day, I don't know anybody who spends eight hours working, eight hours in leisure, eight hours right. sleeping. Right. There's no, no balance. It's more of a balancing act. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And how can you balance all of the duties and responsibilities and the hats that you wear in your life? And that's where a calendar comes in because it can really give yeah. you a foundation for success. Absolutely. And listen, we got to wrap up, guys, but I want to share this awesome book that I'm reading with you for all the um, co-preneurs in the house. You may not be able to see it but it's called Sleeping With Your Business Partner. It is by uh, Becky L. Stewart Gross and PhD and Michael J. Gross. Okay, so it's a couple. And guys, get this book because it really gives a lot of great tips, but I want, I want to sort of implore couples who are struggling um, because most of them that we encounter yep. are in some way. It doesn't matter if you, even if you're making the money that you want to make, the whole dynamic of being in business with your partner, it could be a beautiful, amazing thing. You can dominate in yes. a way that other people can't. And what I love here, this, this book is a little, a few years old, but it's still got some really good, interesting um, statistics. It says at least 75% of all U.S. corporations are family owned or controlled. Family businesses employ 50% of the workforce and generate 50% of the gross national product. There are 12.2 million self-employed business owners. More than 550,000 small businesses are launched each year. 85% of new jobs in North America will be created by small businesses with couple-owned businesses making up the majority. Home-based businesses represent 52% of all small firms. Approximately 80% of home-based businesses are couple-owned and operated. 67% um, of Americans dream of owning their own business. 5.6 million workers ages 50 and older are now self-employed, which is deep because yeah. people aren't even going back into the workforce, y'all. And 80% of boomers plan to work during their retirement. 78 million boomers are on the cusp of their 60s. Why is that so important? Because nobody's getting the gold watch and retiring and right. going and golfing. We live longer. We live younger, right? So if you have had a dream, to be in business with your partner, or if you have been struggling with the business that you're doing with your partner, you need to get with a tribe that can support you, yeah. that can help you build your business, that can help you find your ideal clients, that can help you reach six figures and go beyond. Trust and believe. I know that it seems hard to believe that you can do that because there was a time the when we were like, is this ever gonna happen? Like exactly. this? Well, let me tell you something. All you need is the steps and the principles and put those in place with a team that's around you to support you and you can do it. Yeah. And every, the world is doing it. Did you know that millennials aren't even thinking about going into corporate? They're all thinking about businesses. They're getting on YouTube. They're blowing up. They're launching businesses here and there and everywhere. They've got it. It's us that are kind of coming late to the party. And the boomers, they're not going to get a retirement package. They're starting businesses. That's I meet right. them at every conference. I'm like, wow, this lady's eight years old and launching her business. It's not too late for you. And that's why what we do is so important and tuning in on a weekly basis to marry through the business is key and joining the couples business school is key. Why? Because it takes more than passion. Yeah. You know, I was just saying this the other day as we close. Listen, if you love to eat, does that mean that you know how to cook? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It doesn't, right? If you have a passion for whatever it is you want to do, does that mean that you have the proper skill sets to run an effective business? Not necessarily. So business is a skill that right. must be developed, right? Business is something that is going to take a whole lot of blood, sweat, and tears and effort and energy and tenacity to do. And it requires being in an environment where you're around other business owners that you can glean from. And so we're excited about offering this to you and creating the tribe that Daniel talked about. And so we encourage you to reach out to us if you have any questions, if you want to belong to a tribe, if you want to enter into a program that will really help you to launch pat your career or take it from where it's been to the next level. That's what we're here for. So we just want to thank you yep. for participating in this Facebook experience. And we will see you guys next week. Now, 
because this is new, I got to walk over to the screen and shut down. <laughs> so if I get up and walk away and seems weird, don't, don't feel bad. This, this is, is, this is, is what we Let's do. do it. <laughs> See you next time.